It's our privilege today to be speaking with David Hill. David Hill is the founder of the UK-based charity There Is Hope and also the creator of the international campaign Try Praying. David, thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure. David, we understand that you are the creator of this international campaign Try Praying and there's a popular prayer guide and app by the same name. How did you come across this idea for this international campaign? Well, it was a totally random conversation that I had with somebody. Uh, I wasn't looking to do anything like this at all. But um, it's about 10 years ago now, uh, I was at a conference in Scotland. And, uh, and in fact, I, um, at the time, we'd been involved in writing a 40-day prayer guide. And uh, I met somebody at the conference who explained that her aunt had become a Christian uh, because of this 40-day prayer guide. Um, so I thought, well, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, but I thought that's the most inappropriate piece of literature to give a, a non-Christian. Um, and I thought it was, just, it was just a simple light bulb moment. Why don't we write a prayer guide for people who aren't religious and don't do church? And um, it took me some time uh, to tease out the idea. I thought somebody must have done this. Um, somebody must have come up with something like this, but I couldn't find it. So I ended up, I ended up writing it, which is a bit of a joke because I hate prayer guides. Uh, I lose the will to live when I get prayer guides. So I ended up writing one. How's about that? <laughs> um, but I wrote it and uh, it's um, got the little visual aid. Here we are. So there it is. Uh, try praying. It's a, seven, it's a seven day prayer guide for, um, uh, as we like to say, the decent self-respecting agnostic to be able to use uh, without perjuring themselves. And it just takes a person from... Um, point zero really uh, a person who's open but wants to find out about god but it's got the gospel in it and over the course of seven days um they run a high risk of becoming a christian by the end so so that's where the idea came from and um that's some time ago now and uh i suppose i should say that there were one or two key moments in the whole process um i never would have thought uh try praying would have developed to the extent that it has um, but shortly before uh, it was printed, the first edition, uh, I just felt it was a nudge from the Lord. Uh, I get very few <clears throat> nudges from God, but this was a very definite nudge. And uh, I felt him ask me, how is it going to be used? Uh, because what the church does not need is another resource on prayer. The churches have got thousands of resources on prayer. Um, so just a simple back of the envelope, um, two minute thought a strategy for a church project and and it goes goes like this one week everybody in a congregation gets a copy of the try praying booklet and they use it themselves um, uh, it can be said and encouraged in exactly the right way for a congregation you know you're all christians here and you've all got wonderful prayer lives ha ha and uh, and this is for non-christians uh, but just use it yourself this week and so that's week one and then week two the next week everybody is encouraged to pray for a God-given opportunity to, to give this booklet to a friend or a colleague or somebody to bump into and, and simply say, look, why don't you try praying for a week and see what happens in your life? So that was, that was it. It was, all, it was a moment, but uh, it was just a strategy for a church project. Um, use it and lose it. Um, so that was the booklet and then the strategy for church and things have begun to develop from there. David, you've been involved in Christian ministry for many years. When did prayer become a particular focus for you personally? Um, uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, I'd like to say right at the start. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, I heard one of your earlier interviewees talking about J. Edwin Orr. I think it was a month ago. And um, I saw a video recording of J. Edwin Orr uh, speaking at a Dallas prayer conference in 1973. Three, I think it was, on the role of prayer and spiritual awakening. And uh, it's, um, it was 22, 23 minutes of church history, revival church history. Well, I watched that, it's years ago now, it's decades ago when I watched it. And um, those 23 minutes uh, transformed my life. Uh, it was astounding. It wasn't biblical encouragement or exhortation or teaching about prayer. It was simply what God has done in answer to prayer. And I thought, we are just paddling in the shallows in terms of what we're seeing take place. 
and we need to we need to pray to a big God who can do big things. So that whole um, revival strand uh, became a bit of a driver for me in a number of the things that I've done over the years since then. And uh, so that's been that's been very important to me. Thank you. At, at what point, David, did you realize that this Try Praying campaign would go internationally? I understand that you've just brought the campaign to Australia and the U.S. Well, uh, yeah, again, that was a, a great surprise to me. Um, uh, we were, when I had the idea and the first development of it into a printed booklet, uh, I was living in Yorkshire in, um, in England. That's about halfway up the, uh, the British Isles. And um, in case you didn't know, I'm a Yorkshire man, actually. And uh, you need to know that Yorkshire actually is the center of the world. Um, but uh, at the time we were living there and uh, uh, without going into all the details, God led us back to Edinburgh where we had lived before. And um, I, I thought my, my role was essentially to produce this booklet and to make it available to churches, particularly in Edinburgh. And, and that was it. Um, to see if it could become a multi-church project in Edinburgh. Quite early on in the, in the process of coming back to Edinburgh, I was invited to um, speak at a, at a prayer meeting, uh, some wonderful people who pray in uh, um, Holyrood, the, uh, the parliament in Edinburgh, um, every week that the parliament is sitting. And I was invited to go and speak. I knew some of the people from before. So I went along and I told some stories about try praying and showed them the booklet and so on. And then they prayed. Um, so how can I describe this? Um, they're not quiet prayers. <laughs> they're just a wonderful group, about 15 people, but they just really, as we say here, they gave it some welly and, and they really prayed a huge encouragement and affirmation of uh, the use of try praying. But there's somebody visiting that group, and um, she uh, she had I wasn't even, never met her before, but she really had a gift of prophecy because she she said, "This try praying thing is for the nation." And and I thought this isn't this isn't mock humility at all, but I thought it's only a booklet. Um, and then she corrected herself and and she said, "No, actually, this is for the nations, plural." And I thought I am just totally out of my depth here. I have absolutely no idea what is going on. But people were seeing in this far more than I was. The, um, the original designer, the person who kind of branded the whole thing, uh, a lovely Christian uh, with a, a kind of high-end design studio in, in Edinburgh, uh, I, I, I gave her an earlier edition and uh, she was going to redesign it and brand it. And I said, look, the point of this is that it's for the non-Christian. And, uh, and she, I always remember the moment, but her eyes filled with tears and, uh, and she said, this is huge. And again, on the inside, I was saying, it's only a booklet. Um, so people were seeing in this far more than I was. So that's going back some time. And, uh, and what has happened, just to try and speed through some history, that uh, we ended up with a, um, a campaign in Edinburgh in the first year and that drew 70 churches together to, to be involved in a simultaneous use of this try praying, uh, the um, use it and lose it strategy uh, in March. And uh, we also had bus advertising. Uh, so we, we wanted to put it into public space. So, um, so that was the year one. And then the next two or three years, it was being to seep out across Scotland to other towns and cities. Um, and then it's begun to seep out across uh, across the UK, and then there was little snippets of interest here, there, and and everywhere from other places. So um, I, I, I think I've kind of caught up with the the kind of bigger vision of this, uh, but it took me probably about three years to realise this was a little bit more than a booklet for use by churches in Edinburgh, because uh, it has spread across across the UK, and uh, it is it's in. Australia, New Zealand, in an embryonic way, and in the States as well. Um, mm. It's uh, two or three cities that are beginning to use it. Um, so we're very excited about that. So we're seeing where it's going to go. Um, we're just um, keeping pushing it out and seeing where it gets to, but it's just been a huge adventure. Wow. What were some of the uh, early stories floating back from the application of this booklet that most encouraged you? 
Well, we do have a, a raft of stories that have come, come back to us. I, I have to say, I mean, it's worthwhile saying that, um, that there's, there's a lot of ordinary in what's, what's gone on, but some of the stories that have come back to us are extraordinary, which have been so thrilling. So I'll tell, I'll tell you two or three. Um, there's one, for example, um, of a church in Dunfermline, which is just uh, across the Firth of Forth. If you know the geography, there's Edinburgh and there's the, the sea, the Firth of Forth, uh, and Dunfermline is across the, uh, the sea there in Fife. And um, so one of the ideas that a church leader came up with is to put a little perspex box um, outside their church on their railings Next, next to a banner which says Try Praying, <clears throat> and in the Perspex box uh, are a few Try Praying booklets and a notice for people to help themselves. So that was going on in the church. Um, along with that, there's a, there's a remarkable lady in that church um, uh, called Anne, and uh, she has an incredible ministry of going into one of the local parks and looking after, uh, you know, some of the alcoholics and, um, drug addicts and she's done this for years and years just seeing that they're fed and safe and so on so she was in this park one day and she heard a mother and a daughter talking together and she joined the conversation because the daughter was saying to the mother so it's a little bit a little bit detailed this story but you have to you have to kind of hold on to the details because there's a good punchline um so the the daughter was saying to the to the mother she was looking forward to spending the money she had saved on her birthday presents and the mother was saying, well, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to do that because we need to use that money to buy food and to pay for the electricity bill. So Anne joined this conversation and said, uh, can I help somehow? And to cut a long story short, she uh, took it to the local supermarket. She bought them some food, paid the electricity bill. She bought the, the, the woman a coffee. She bought the girl an ice cream, gave her some money for her birthday. And uh, the, the woman said to her, are you from that church? And she said, well, I am, as it happens. And she said, well, two days ago, I picked up a Try Praying booklet from that Perspex box outside. And for the first time in my life, I prayed that God would send somebody to help me. And here are you helping me like this. Wow. That's Great amazing. story. Uh, we, have, we just have, as I say, a raft of stories. Uh, there's another, another good one, actually. Um, uh, slightly amusing, but I was um, I was preaching at a church uh, in Fife again, as it happens, north of Edinburgh, and uh, the um, people always like me to tell the latest news on Try Praying. So I told the latest story that I'd heard, and it was a story of somebody who'd come to faith. Um, the route was uh, it was um, Try Praying booklet and an Alpha course, and then he'd been baptised in the sea in the Firth of Forth. And in Scotland, only the brave do that. Um, so um, anyway, I told that story in this congregation and a man put his hand up and said, that was me. So my first reaction was, I hope I've told that properly. <laughs> and, uh, so I said, well, look, let's have a, have a coffee afterwards and, and you can tell me your story. So I listened to him and uh, the more he shared his story, the more I realized this was not the story that I'd heard. Because although his story was a tri frame booklet and an alpha cross and then baptized, um, he had been baptized on the north side of the Firth of Forth. And the story I'd heard was somebody who'd been baptized on the south side of the Firth of Forth. So two people had exactly the same route to faith. And it turns out we've managed to introduce them to each other. And they've been, um, uh, they were baptized about a week apart in, in the sea on the, on the Firth of Forth. So that was a fun story. Amazing. Wow. Oh, and actually, just to throw in another little detail on that. Sorry, you've got me on a roll here. I'm telling stories. But um, uh, the, uh, when I spoke with this guy, he's called Wilson. Um, he's, his wife is a Christian, and she had um, wanted him to become a Christian. He wasn't a Christian. And she um, put the Try Praying booklet on their coffee table in their, in their home. And he said that it just seemed like every day he came home, the tri plane booklet had got closer to him where he sat. And he eventually picked it up and he read it uh, in bed that night. And he read it all in a one hour, rather than doing it a day at a time. Um, he read it all in a one hour. And when he finished it, he simply said, he looked up from his bed and he said, hello. 
and that was his prayer. And that was what started him on the journey to faith and then into the Alpha Course and uh, baptism and so on. Wow. So we, we have to say, we've got lots of stories. Uh, it's just been really thrilling. I'll tell some more of it later on, but I'm sure you've got another question you want to ask me. <laughs> Praise God for what he's doing. Those, those are genuinely amazing. Thank you very much. David, one of the things that uh, we first notice when we encounter the Try Praying literature or the Try Praying campaign is it's really beautifully done. The, uh, the graphic design work is, is gorgeous. The, the app is smooth and very, uh, very user-friendly, so we say. Uh, how is it that technology, in your view, can help structure prayer? How is it technology can aid our prayer lives? Mm, mm. Well, I, I can't take any credit for the, uh, for the design of Try Praying and the branding of it. And, things like that. That's been, that's been other people, which has been great. Uh, I do think that's been important, actually. I think um, some, something that's attractive and accessible is, uh, is very important. Um, I'm probably not the best person to, to answer that particular question, but um, my, my own thoughts in it are that uh, obviously prayer is a person talking with the Lord, and it's, and it's personal and it's, um, uh, and it's articulation of needs and desires and so on to the Lord. So how can technology help in that? Well, I think only in the possibility of, um, of either motivating people to do it or of linking churches or linking Christians together to do it in some way or another. Um, so for example, I heard, if I attended a little, little prayer, an early morning prayer meeting in a church down near London, and um, there are only about five or six people there. Um, but there was one guy actually on his laptop and everything that was being said and prayed in the, in the prayer meeting, he was typing away and so on. Uh, and it turns out there's, there were lots of other people who were listening in, but it was being streamed live to people who were commuting to work in London. So they were either listening to it on the tube or on the train or whatever and joining in like that. So that's a good little way of uh, connecting people together and helping to motivate them to pray. That's one little detail, one idea. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, there are, there are good app, <clears throat> apps around and so on. Uh, some better than others, I'm sure, but uh, there certainly are some good ones which help. Um, but the heart of it is people praying. David, your literature states that try praying is for those who are not religious and don't do church. And we understand that uh, at the original vision of try praying was this idea of having a prayer guide for those who are non-religious. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, what is it that makes prayer transformative for people of all backgrounds, whether they're religious or have no religious background whatsoever? Okay, a story, if I may. Um, so uh, I personally have my best evangelistic conversations in the sauna. Uh, so I'm not a great fitness fiend, but uh, I do get down to the gym once a week and I have a sauna afterwards. And it's such a fascinating um, space in which to meet people. You're sat there with uh, your clothes, but you don't have a lot of clothes on in a confined space. And you know, what's, what's the rules? Do you talk or do you not? And uh, so anyway, I just, I just try and see if I can get into conversations and uh, ask questions and find out how often they get down there and what they do and so on. And then sooner or later, they kind of switch the conversation and say, well, so what do you do? And for me, that's just a great in. I say, um, uh, well, it's a bit hard to explain, but I, I'm involved in this project in the city called Try Praying. Unlike us not, they'll say, oh yeah, I've seen that. Uh, and so I can share my testimony and so on. Anyway, I was in the sauna one time. It's so strange this, but I was in the sauna. Um, and um, there were two guys in there, uh, really muscular guys, uh, bodybuilder types, got tattoos all over their arms and body. And uh, they were talking kind of blokes, body stuff about the exercises that they do and they were teasing or joking about another person who's got thin legs and he falls over when he plays football. So it's just that kind of conversation. So I was sitting there, I think, mm, there's no conversation for me here. Um, but then one of them said, and this is to answer your question, actually. Um, one of them said to the other that things at home were really difficult and uh, things have been kicking off with his wife and him and his kids. And uh, I was really messed up, he said, and uh, um, I told, he said, I prayed and uh, I told God that if he was to heal me, I'd stop being a bad person. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I thought, is this a conversation I should get in on? So 
well, they're all time limited conversations in a sauna. By this time, the two of them were just about to get out. And I, and I jumped in and I said, so, so what happened? Tell me. And he said, well, it, it was just that, you know, I was really in a mess. And um, I decided to pray. He said, I'm not, I'm not a Christian or Muslim or anything. Uh, but I told God that if he, if he was to heal me, I would stop being a bad person. And I used to mess people up. He used to get in a lot of fights and so on. And, and he said, that's exactly what happened. God healed me, he sorted out my life, and uh, I've stopped being a bad person. So that guy is not um, a card-carrying Christian, going to church, evangelical, charismatic, whatever. He's, um, he's, just, he's kind of nowhere on that particular scale, but he's had an experience of God meeting his need, and that's transformed his life. And I'd like to believe that that's the first step on a road which will lead him all the way through to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, but that's you know, to come on to your question, it, it's, it's intuitive to so many people that when they're in a fix, they pray. I, I remember a conversation on a train with somebody and um, I asked the guy, uh, he was about 25 years old, and I said, um, if I just ask you, do you, whether you're a religious person, whether you ever prayed? And he said, well, I'm not at all religious, but I have prayed. I prayed once for somebody who's seriously ill and they died and I prayed for somebody else who's seriously ill and they got better so I've got 50 percent success he said <laughs> uh, and that just led into a conversation I said it's not prayer is not just about getting stuff uh, it's it's a relationship and uh, getting to know God and so we, we had we chatted for about 10 minutes um, but there again you know 25 year old no connection with church or, or religion but when there's a problem people pray and I think somehow or other tri praying has kind of been able to uh, ride in on that possibility because it's evangelism themed by prayer and it just makes it accessible to, um, to people who do pray. They don't go to church necessarily, but they, they will pray. And uh, as I said earlier, the, the booklet and the app just leads a person to put their trust in Christ. David, if you were addressing a group of ministers, uh, perhaps from an international background, and addressing on the importance of prayer. And maybe one of the pastors were to ask you, David, it seems to me like um, the church is under a lot of change right now. There's a lot of change that's needed. The rise of technology and other factors mean that all of our social institutions, businesses, schools, and also churches are facing a lot of pressures that require them to change. And uh, maybe prayer is the front edge of how God is reshaping the church today. How would you respond to that idea? What, what, what is the place of prayer in our churches today? Good question. I, I think a lot of people would say, um, not enough. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not central enough. Um, but um, so many church leaders and pastors would say, yes, you know, we have to get back to the essentials of, of our faith. And, and prayer is, is just, it needs to be number one. And along with that, I'd put evangelism as well, just really the communication of the gospel is absolutely central. So a church that is praying, uh, whether that's many or few, uh, and a church that's sharing the gospel, I think they're absolutely essential, foundational to the life of any, of any church. David, if I can ask you a question that we've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united today? How would we recognize this unity? And what is it that we can do as Christians today to pursue the unity for which Jesus prays in John 17? Well, I, I do smile at that. Um, reading John 17, Jesus set the bar so high in terms of unity. Uh, what a prayer that uh, they might be brought to complete unity as he and the Father were united. Um, and that by this, that the world would know. Um, so, you know, as I said, the bar is so high in terms of what the, what the unity uh, could be, should be, what he prayed for. And it, I guess it remains an unanswered prayer of Jesus still, because we're, we're not there at all. However, there are, from time to time and in different places, good expressions of the unity that Christ prayed for. And... Uh, whether that's just at an individual level, you know, an individual meeting Christians or in a house group or whatever, just the, just the you know, a genuine um, uh, appreciation and love for each other that can be there, that is a beautiful thing. 
uh, that is um, an expression of the unity. Um, it becomes a bit tricky when we start um, putting that onto a macro level in terms of individual uh, churches in a town or a city or denominations. That's where it begins to get a bit hard. Um, I think there are nevertheless some, some good expressions of unity. In a lot of cities, there are, uh, there are unity movements that are springing up. Certainly in the UK, that is, that is the case. Uh, we ha I don't want to overstate it because it's still slightly, something embryonic, but here in Edinburgh, um, there is a weekly prayer meeting that draws together church leaders from um, largely the kind of charismatic end of the church, but it's a, just a wonderful prayer meeting, meeting once a week. But there's also three times a year something I've been involved in leading, something called Transforming Edinburgh, <clears throat> and uh, that draws, um, well, probably about 50 or so church leaders together from different churches, broader um, strata of church, as it were. Uh, <clears throat> so these kind of unity movements that spring up and they're, uh, they're good. Sometimes they run for a long time. Sometimes they're there for a season until a networker kind of moves on and it needs other leadership to take over and so on. I think all these are good, good expressions of it. Um, but I think we've still got a long way to go. But the interesting thing is that when there is the unity uh, and when um, th th there is manifestation of the unity of Christ, the non-Christians notice. Uh, and just to dive in a, a little bit into, into try praying momentarily in that, that um, uh, one of the things that, are, that I've loved and I think other people have loved is that um, uh, we, we campaign try praying once a, once a year and this... Um, this April, for example, uh, it was everywhere across Scotland. Uh, there were buses with tri praying banners on and uh, on the trains and in the stations. And very interestingly and encouragingly, many, many churches um, had tri praying banners outside. So that visible expression of a, of a kind of, it's a narrow piece of the unity, as it were, um, but it's a visible expression of unity in the gospel. Has, uh, has touched so many lives. There's a lovely story of, um, uh, of, a, of a person in uh, the north of Scotland in a place called Peterhead who contacted us um, quite early in the year in January and she said, so we, she knew, she'd heard that we wanted to see if we could extend the tri praying campaign across all of Scotland this year and uh, to put adverts on all the, all the, all the media in the cities. So she phoned and she said, do, they, do the buses that go from Aberdeen also go to Peterhead? And uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't know, so we found out and they do. So, so she said, right, I'm going to get the Peterhead churches involved in Try Praying. And she did. She spoke at the Churches Together meeting and she, she spoke individually with some church leaders and she got all the churches in this town. It's a fishing town in the north of Scotland. And uh, she got them all involved. So they all had tri praying banners outside, all with piles of booklets for the churches to do this use it and lose it thing. Uh, and she found a thousand pounds to put into the budget to make sure there was plenty of buses up from Aberdeen. Then in, fe in February, she emailed us and she said, do the buses that go from Aberdeen to Peterhead also go to Fraserburgh? And we didn't know. Uh, so we found out and they do. So she said, right, I'm gonna get the Fraserburgh churches involved. And sure enough, she did. <laughs> so it's just, a, and again, it's just a very narrow thing on the whole unity issue, but visible expression of unity is important. And, but this lady, Liz Strachan, she said um, just a week ago, she said, I'll tell you what Try Praying has done for the churches in Peterhead. It's brought them together. Mm. We are extremely grateful to be speaking this morning with David Hill founder of the UK-based charity There Is Hope and also of the international campaign Try Praying. David, thank you so much for sharing your insights and time with us this morning. Great, thank you. It's been great to be with you. Thank you.